Thank you. you. May be seated. If you have a copy of God's Word as you're being seated, would you turn to the book of Habakkuk? The book of Habakkuk. I encourage you maybe to go to Matthew and, as Dr. Dan said last week, take a left and go back a couple of books. Um, we're going to look at two books that I, I feel almost positive you have probably never heard a sermon from. If you have, it's not been many. But what you'll find is you'll recognize some verses that are found in the New Testament that come directly out of these two Old Testament books. I'm excited to preach these two minor prophets. We have one more minor prophet, Malachi, next Sunday morning, and then we'll dive and jump into the New Testament together. We jump into the 10th and 11th prophets of the minor prophets, that is. And remember, they're minor not because that they are their message is minor, but because they are shorter in length. Today, we look at Habakkuk, which is about the average minor prophet. We look at Zechariah, which is the longest 14 chapters found in the book of Zechariah. We'll have the same pattern we looked at last week. The Dr. Dan Caldwell was with us. We'll look at one of the prophets who was before the exile. That was Habakkuk. We'll look at the other prophet, which was after the exile, the remnant has returned home. And we'll talk about that, which is Zechariah. We pick up on the prophet Habakkuk who prophesied as Babylon was coming to major power. The Assyrians were declining in power and God was raising up the Babylonians. We think it's somewhere either they were already in major power or they were coming to power where Habakkuk begins to prophesy. We know absolutely nothing about Habakkuk other than his particular message. But Habakkuk asked two really important questions. Ask some of the Lord, and from that reply, Habakkuk breathes a prayer that includes two powerful truths we'll look at in a moment. We'll find words of challenge and encouragement. The second book is the minor prophet, Zechariah. Now, we know some things about Zechariah. Again, he is the second longest of those minor prophets. He prophesied during the reign of King Darius. We also see Ezra, uh, that Ezra talked about, gives us the background as the prophet Haggai and Zechariah prophesied in very close proximity together. He was a priest, Zechariah was, as well as a prophet, much like the prophets Jeremiah and Ezekiel. We see that he prophesied alongside Haggai to encourage the remnant to continue to rebuild the temple. Where Haggai really encouraged him is last week to get to rebuilding the temple. Zechariah doesn't focus as much on the actual building, but the building of their hearts and their lives. And that when that happened, they would then see the need and the necessity to rebuild the temple. Because the work of the temple had stopped. Zechariah brings a message of hope and encouragement to the struggling remnant as well as a word of challenge. He brings to us words of encouragement and really this message that God is thank goodness is in the business of the second and the third and the fourth and so on chance God that he is. Aren't you glad God didn't just give you one chance at this life? Aren't you glad God's given you, I say one chance at this life, overall you only got one shot at this life, but through that life God gives us multiple opportunities to have what I call a do-over. I remember as a kid sometimes, you want to say, or moms and dads, we'd be, it'd be 9 o'clock, maybe you have one of those mornings this morning, and we just want to stop and say, you know what, we're going to stop and do this day over again. We're going to start all over and go everybody back to bed and everybody get back up again and say hi again, and let's try this day again. That's the kind of God that we have. A God that allows second chances. We also see in Zechariah a large amount of prophecy about the coming Messiah as well as some incredibly, incredibly bizarre, oftentimes, much like Ezekiel visions that Zechariah has that are apocalyptic in nature and refer to the second coming of Christ. Zechariah is quoted some 71 different times in or alluded to in the New Testament alone. Most of those found in the book of Revelation. Two profound messages, one from Habakkuk and one from Zechariah. Listen to what the word says. Look at Habakkuk on your outline there and Habakkuk's request. We find it in chapter 1, beginning in verses 1 through 4 of the book of Habakkuk. Let's read those together. The oracle which Habakkuk the prophet saw, How long, O Lord, will I call for help and you will not hear? Wow, what a way to start a book, huh? And I cry out to you violence, yet you do not say. Why do you make me see iniquity and cause me to look on wickedness? Yes, destruction and violence are before me. Strife exists and contention arises. 
Therefore, the law is ignored and justice is never upheld. For the wicked surround the righteous. Therefore, justice comes out perverted. Habakkuk asks two questions. The first found in chapter 1. The second one in chapter 2 we'll look at in just a moment. But he asks this question. How long, O Lord? Is there ever times in your life that you look around in your own life, in our nation, in our state, in our city, maybe in your own life? And we ask the question, Lord, how long, how long will you tolerate this world? How long will you tolerate the evil and the the awful state of the world in which we live in? Habakkuk was asking that question. Not only that question, he's also asking this question. God is the overall theme of the book. He talks about, God, how long are you going to let evil prevail? God, I'm looking at it and I don't don't hear you answering me. Why does it seem that the wicked prosper? Why do bad things happen to good people, to those who are doing what is right? Lord, why do you allow evil to continue? You see, we're not the first to ask those questions. Habakkuk asked them thousands and thousands of years ago. The same questions that we ask today. And we'll find that Habakkuk gets his answer. An answer that we all need to hear this morning as well. But maybe, let me ask the question. When's the last time you ask, how long, O Lord? How long? Secondly, he asks in chapter 2, verse 1, or he makes a statement really of his request. He prays again. Look at verse 1 of chapter 2. I will stand on my guard post and station myself on the rampart. And I will keep watch to see what he will speak to me and how I may reply when I am reproved, when I'm corrected. Habakkuk makes a great statement. It's why we stopped and prayed this morning. Too often we run and jump before we pray. And yet God calls us to pray. Habakkuk asks the question. God answers him before he prays the second part of his prayer. Before he goes and waits before the Lord. But we're going to put them together. But he says, Lord, I'm going to wait on you. We've talked about this before. None of us like to wait on the Lord. We like the Lord to answer immediately. Yesterday would be better than even today. God, would you answer? God, would you show? God, would you do this? God, would you answer in this way? And yet Habakkuk has the understanding that we're called sometimes just to wait before the Lord. Because in those moments when we wait before the Lord and God is waiting, if he will, to give us an answer, what happens? We're seeking God more than ever. We're learning things about the Lord. We're learning things about ourselves, about our circumstances in our lives. And we begin to get God's perspective as we wait before the Lord. He waits for God to answer. Are you willing to wait? Habakkuk makes a request. The second thing we see is God's reply. God's reply, he's going to answer Habakkuk's question. Look back in chapter 1, verse 5. You'll flip back over there. And God gives a reply about Judah's rebellion and God's response to it. Habakkuk is talking about his nation. If you remember back to the study, if we've looked at these prophets, you already know that evil was rampant. They were saying they were worshiping God, but at the same time they're worshiping all the other false gods. There was no justice. There was no mercy. They oppressed the widow and the poor. In other words, we did all the outward trappings of our religion, but our hearts were far from God. And Habakkuk is asking, Lord, how long are you going to tolerate this? How long will you allow it to last? And God gives his answer in verse number five. Look among the nations, observe, be astonished, wonder, because I'm about to do something in your day. You would not believe it if you were told. Now, this is not a good thing, by the way. In verse six, he tells us, for I'm raising up the Chaldeans, the Babylonians, and they're going to come and they are going to lay waste to my city, Jerusalem. God was not going to allow evil to go unanswered. But God does say, I will answer it and it will be in my timing. But I will not tolerate their sin forever and I will act and it will be swift and it will be harsh. For it will come from the nation of Babylon to judge God's judgment against them for their sin and their rebellion and their rejection of God as the one true and living God. Boy, if you're a back and you get that answer, that's not maybe the answer maybe he was looking for. But nonetheless, that was God's answer. The second answer that God gives 
is about Babylon's evil and God's response to it. And back to chapter 2. So in chapter, the end of chapter 1, God answers about what's going to happen to his people. Then chapter 2, where he answers, or, or, or Habakkuk is waiting before the Lord, he answers him and said, this is what I'm going to do, what he's going to use the Babylonians. Look what he says in verse 2. Then the Lord answered me and said, Record the vision and scribe it on the tablets that the one who reads it may run. For the vision is yet for the appointed time. It hastens toward the goal and it will not fail. Though it tarries, wait for it. For it will certainly come. It will not delay. Habakkuk is telling the people as God speaks to Habakkuk, I'm going to use the Babylonians. And it's going to be in my time, and it will be astonishing. And Habakkuk asks the question that other prophets ask and says, Lord, I know that we're wicked, but how in the world would you use the Babylonians? They're far more wicked than we are. Why would you use them? And God is basically saying, listen, I don't condone their ways. And he gives five woes in chapter 2 about the evil ways of the Babylonians. But what he does say is, I'm sovereign over all things. I will use nations to accomplish my plan and my purpose. I will do that. But know this much. Their evil will not go unpunished either. God will use them. But God expected them to be within the boundaries of which he set. But the Babylonians, of course, went far beyond that. And their evil would not go unpunished. Notice this statement. God will not stand idly by and watch evil prevail forever. Now, it may seem that way to us in our eyes and in our experience in our time of this world but listen to me carefully there is a day and Zechariah is going to talk about it there is a day coming where evil will cease to exist and every person who has done evil and the evil of this world will be held to account evil will not have the last word today it might in your life but God says evil will not have the last word. Notice the three promises God gives in the middle of this chapter 2. In the middle of warning the Babylonians. Listen to what he says, three promises. Number one, a powerful verse here. We found this verse, by the way, quoted in the book of Galatians, in the book of Romans, and the book of Hebrews. A profound theological statement. It's one of the reasons why the Old Testament is so important. There are those out there who would declare and say the Old Testament is not necessary, it is outdated, it is archaic. But if we chunk the Old Testament, we miss truths like this that the New Testament writers found and pulled into the New Covenant, God's Covenant. And we see this, one of these verses in chapter 2, verse 4. Look with me there, in verse 4 it says this. Behold, as for the proud one, his soul is not right within him. But the righteous will live by faith. King James says the just shall live by faith. What is God saying here? The weaving, the understanding of faith and righteousness and how these two weave together. We as believers who follow Christ as Savior and Lord understand that we live by faith. That which we cannot see, that which we don't always understand. But if we are God's children, meaning here, righteous, the right living who live and follow after God, then we will have faith in him no matter what. The just will live by faith. The second promise God's make is the earth will be full of God's glory. Look at verse 14. Look at this promise. I, I, hope, I hope you just want to just sit here for a minute on this verse. Look at verse 14 of chapter 2. For the earth, notice this, I've circled this in my own Bible. The earth will be. It is a guaranteed promise from God. Will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the water covers the sea. In other words, there's a day coming, church, and we don't think about it often enough. We ought to. That there is a day coming when God's glory will cover this entire earth as the water covers the seas. God's glory will cover this entire world. That's when the evil ceases to exist. That's when perfection and heaven is realized. God's glory one day 
is going to cover the entire earth. And what a day that's going to be. Notice the last promise. And this is a significant one for the people of the day, but also for us as well. Chapter 2, verse 20. He says, but the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. Literally means to be, to hush before him all the earth. Verse 18 and 19, he's talking about the false gods. And God says, those gods will fall. Those gods will fail. But God says, I will be in my temple. Now, this is significant because we know the temple is going to be destroyed, right? We know that that's where God's presence was manifested. But God says, I will still be God and my presence will still be with you. Listen, though, in your world, your life, things may fall apart. Things may seem dim. Things may seem hard. But rest assured, not only will the just live by faith, the earth will be full of God's glory, but Thirdly, we see that God promises God is still on his throne today in your life. God is still in control of this world. God still has the last word. God is sovereign, meaning he has the charge and control over everything in this world and everything in your life. And so when things spin out of control, the one place to run is the one who has it all under control. His name is God Almighty. That's our rock. That's our fortress. That's our refuge. That is that solid rock on which we stand. That is how the just live by faith. Because I know in the end, God's got it all. Notice the third part of what Habakkuk says here. We see Habakkuk's first request, God's reply. Then we see a second request, a powerful request. Habakkuk prays a prayer that recognizes who God is and the work that he has done. And he really has two pleas in his prayer. Two requests. Look at verse uh, chapter 3, beginning in verse number 1. Look at what he prays. A prayer of Habakkuk, the prophet. Lord, I have heard the report about you, and I fear. O Lord, revive your work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. Wow. He begins to these other verses talk about how God's power and what God had done. What does he say here? The first request, Lord, revive your work. What was he asking? God, would you revive the works that you did of old? Possibly referring back to the incredible miracles in Egypt and the powerful miracles God did throughout the ages. What does that mean for us? We know what it means for the Jewish people. What does it mean for us? God, revive your works. You know what we're asking? God, would you do for me? I would say, Lord, would you do the works in the church you did in Acts? Would you do those today? God, revive your works. Do we pray that? Do we plead with God in our lives to revive his works? Now listen, before we pray that, we need to consider what that means. Because that means we're turning our lives over to the Lord completely and saying, God, whatever do you want to do, would you revive it and would you use me in that process? Oh, the church, the living God, we begin to pray this prayer. God, revive your works in our day. Second thing, resolve to rejoice. Resolve to rejoice. In verse 16 to 19, he prays a powerful prayer. Powerful words. Listen to what he says. After all this has been given, God has said this is what's going to happen. Judgment will come to Judah. Habakkuk is anticipating that coming. And God says it is going to be horrible and terrible. And the Babylonians will come and the Babylonians will be judged. And so now Habakkuk has wrestled with all that. And now he comes to the end. What do you do with that information? What if you knew coming up this week that life was going to turn south? Would you have the answer Habakkuk had? Look what he says. I heard and my inward parts trembled. At the sound, my lips quivered. Decay enters my bones and in my place I tremble. Because I must wait quietly for the day of distress for the people to arise who will invade us. Let me stop right there for just a moment. (laughs) Did you hear that? 
Habakkuk is scared to death. I've met people that said, well, if you follow God, you'll never be afraid. What? Well, then we need to take this verse out. The Bible says his lip quivered. The way I can relate to that is your child that's in trouble. When you get onto them, and all of a sudden, the stronger you get onto them, the more that lip pokes out and it begins to quiver. The tears are about to flow. Habakkuk is grieved over what's happening. He's scared of what is to come. He is frightened. It is a terrifying thing that's coming. Listen, just because we follow God doesn't mean at times we won't be afraid and we won't know what to do and we won't know what's coming. But may we have this response as he continues in verse 17. I thought, though the fig tree should blossom and though there be no fruit on the vines, though the yield of the olives should fail and the fields produce no food, Though the flock should be cut off from the fold and there be no cattle in the stall, yet, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will exalt in the Lord. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength. And he has made my feet like hinds feet and makes me walk on my high places. Wow, this prayer didn't mean that Habakkuk didn't have doubts, that he wasn't even maybe a little disillusioned and he struggled. But here's what he said at the end of the day. Let me put it in our vernacular. Listen, listen to me. Lord, though, my health would not be great. Lord, though, the things that I treasure, my house or my cars... I might lose them. The job that I hold such in high esteem, I won't have it anymore. I'll have a different job. My kids that I worship, the ground they walk on, things might not go the way I planned. The money that I saved and worked hard for, I might all go away. Yet, I will rejoice. That's not an easy prayer to pray, is it? Let's be really honest. We want to pray that prayer. We want to be that kind of a person. This is the prayer that Job prayed and others have prayed throughout the Old Testament and throughout history. What a powerful word. And I believe, just like Job did when Habakkuk prayed this kind of prayer, it shot an arrow into the heart of God, a missile into God's heart, because Habakkuk says, Lord, though you slay me, I will worship you. Though everything that I treasure, though everything I hold dear is going to be taken away. God, you are still God. You are still on your throne. And I trust you with all that I have. I can do no other. Some of you might be in that moment where you need to declare to the Lord, Lord, I don't understand all that's going on in my life. Though the vine withers, the olive tree doesn't make, my cattle and my sheep all die. Lord, I still trust and rejoice in God, my Savior. That ties in beautifully to the book of Zechariah. We'll have to look at very, very quickly this morning. There's so much here. We're going to take about a 40,000 foot view of Zechariah. But it ties right in with what Habakkuk had been talking about. Because the people return and God gives them a second chance. And yet, even in that second chance, we find in the first verses where they're being called to do the same thing Habakkuk and other prophets had called the nation of Israel to do. Though Habakkuk doesn't specifically do it, the call was to return to the Lord. The first point, return to the Lord and he will return to you. It says, let's look at that that next, that first point there, Michael, if we can. A relationship with the Lord. How do we have it? In the eighth month of the second year of Darius, verse one of chapter one of Zechariah, the word of the Lord came to Zechariah the prophet, the son of uh, Barakia, the son of Edo, saying, Lord, the Lord was very angry with your fathers. Therefore say to them, thus says the Lord of hosts, return to me, declares the Lord of hosts, that I may return to you. Oh, 
says the Lord of hosts. Do not be like your fathers to whom the former prophets proclaimed, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Return now from your evil ways and from your evil deeds. But they did not listen. Or give heed to me, declares the Lord. Your fathers, where are they? And the prophets, do they live forever? But did not my words and my statutes which I commanded my servants, the prophets, overtake your fathers? Then they repented. And said, as the Lord of hosts purposed to do in us according with, in accordance with our ways and our deeds, so he has dealt with us. In a relationship with the Lord, he calls them to do four things. Number one, remember what got you here. He reminds them of the forefathers. Remember how they got to where they were and how you got to where you are. Don't forget Don't repeat the sins of the previous generations. Secondly, return to the Lord and I will return to you. What a promise. Return to the Lord. That means it indicates that sometimes we walk away from our relationship with the Lord. We walk away from that intimate walk with the Lord. And God doesn't move. We're the ones that move. But God indicates to us when we return to him, he returns to us. Now here's the truth. God never leaves us nor forsakes us. But it's the image, the idea that we return, God returns to us. And what does that mean when he returns to us? He pours out his blessings again. The joy comes. The forgiveness of sin comes. And that's what we need in our lives is for God to return. Some of you in this room need God to return to you, but you first must return to him. He won't force you to return. He is the father of the prodigal son, and he says, I won't force you to return. But when you do return, and the door is wide open for you to do so, I will return to you. And we see the picture of the prodigal son running to meet his child and embracing him. And the relationship is returned to what it was supposed to be. How do we do that? Repent of our ways and realize why it is God has rebuked you. He gives a call in chapters 1 through 6 to rebuild the temple. There are eight visions that are placed in the book of Zechariah. We've broken them down. You get to look at them in life groups next week. But there's eight visions. They're placed one and eight together. Um, two and seven are together. Three and six are together. Four and five are put together. And there's these incredible images that time won't allow us to look at this morning. But bottom line, these images talk about what God is doing and what God is going to do in the coming days. What God has done, what God will do. And God's presence and his promise are found to be true. Some incredible scriptures here that we don't have time to look at. I pray you'll take time. I know we're reading a lot of scripture. You'll you'll look some great words in Zechariah that talk about the branch, the coming of the King, Jesus. I doesn't mention Jesus by name, but it's talking about the coming of the Messiah, that he was coming. The third thing we see in Zechariah is that religious requirements are fulfilled by real obedience they are fulfilled by real obedience in chapter 7 and 8 they come they start talking to the to to Zechariah and saying listen we've been fasting and we've been praying and still mourning over the fall of Jerusalem should we still be doing that and Zechariah asks him a pointy question God does rather in verse 5 of chapter 7 in Zechariah and he says say to all the people of the land and to the priest when you fasted and mourned in the fifth and seven months in these 70 years was it actually for me that you fasted and when you eat and drink did you not eat and drink for yourselves and do you not drink for yourselves in other words he says you've done all the outward trappings you've done all the religious things but you didn't do them with the right heart You didn't do them with justice and caring for those who cannot care for themselves. You see, in my heart, in my mind, what we'll do this coming Friday, what we do every week, and we do backpacks, and when we do a a, a backyard kids club, we do a dental clinic. You know what we're doing? We're making certain that what we proclaim to be true, we live out in our church and in our lives. Because God calls us to care for the widow and the orphan. It's a command of God. And we take it to heart and seriously that it fulfills our mission to do that, which God has called us to do, to engage those people. To not just sit and say, well, they'll figure it out. There's some other way somebody else will provide. They might. But we've heard God's call and said, yes, Lord, we will answer. In other words, 
we all day long can say a lot of things. And we can even do a lot of things. But if our heart is not right before the Lord. And while we saw the prophets where he said, I don't desire your sacrifices. Your feasts are an abomination to me. The very things God prescribed, he says, are, are no longer valid, basically. Why? Because they were doing it with the wrong heart. And so here in Zechariah, God is calling his people to, yes, rebuild the temple, but rebuild it with the right kind of heart. And there in chapter 7, he talks about how that looks. Dispense, verse 8, true justice and practice, kindness and compassion, each to his brother, and that... The oppressed, do not press the widow or the orphan, the stranger or the poor. Do not devise evil in your hearts against one another. Talks about their hearts were like a flint. Oh, such great other words here. I wish I had time. Three, three truths here. The Lord is passionate about his people. The Lord is passionate about inside and not just the outside. We go all the way back to 1 Samuel. Even back then and all the way to this point, and we do the same today. We look at the outside and God says, I'm not concerned about the outside. I'm concerned about your heart. Because if your heart is right, the outside will take care of itself. It really will. I mean, a lot of times, really, quite frankly, a preacher's job, honestly, really is just to preach one sermon. Now, we don't do that because nobody will come back and hear the same sermon every single week. Right? But here's the truth. If we get our hearts right with God and we walk with God, God will work all the rest of it out. It will come as a natural outflow of what God is doing inside of our hearts. The Lord is passionate about our obedience. The last one in chapters 9 through 14. The restoration and reign of the Lord. Zechariah gives these images of the coming Messiah. Now, here was the challenge that Zechariah is looking at, the coming of the Messiah. But oftentimes, you've seen it talked about before. Zechariah couldn't tell these were two different events. The coming of the shepherd who would be pierced, Zechariah talks about, was the first coming of Christ that we'll begin to read about in the book of Matthew in just two short Sundays. Now, what Zechariah did know that it would take some four to five hundred years before his prophecy would come true. But it would come true, and that shepherd that was different than the shepherds that had been shepherding his people, Jesus would be a different kind of shepherd, the good shepherd. And he would come and die for his people, for you and for me. He is the true shepherd. And then he talks about his second coming. And let me make this statement, and I, I am through this morning. Some great prophecies in Zechariah 9, verse 9, talks about Jesus coming in on a donkey. When Jesus comes the second time, he's already come the first. And we know he came as a humble servant. He took on flesh. He had to sleep like we do. He had to sweat like we do. He had to take a bath like we do. He had to eat like we do. He had to deal with the temptations that we deal with. When he came and humbled himself and became a servant, obedient to death on a cross. But make no mistake, dear friend, that is the way to meet Jesus because you do not want to meet Jesus when he returns again. Let me say this statement so clearly. You say, wait, you don't mean to meet Jesus? Folks, when Jesus comes the second time, he will come as King of kings and Lord of lords, and he will make all things right. And then it will be too late. God is the God of second chances. But on that day, when he returns, or you draw your last breath, whichever comes first, listen to me carefully. It's too late. But here's the good news. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. And God has you here for a reason, friend. If you don't know Christ as Savior and as Lord, you can know him today before you leave this building. Would you pray for me this morning?